Okay. Great. Okay, welcome. We're here today with Craft Chat and Fuller Craft Museum. My name is Sage Brousseau and I am Director of Education at Fuller Craft Museum. Oops, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm here from Fuller Craft Museum to introduce you to today's craft chat. Um, our mission at Fuller Craft Museum is to provide meaningful discovery of contemporary craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. We're committed to challenging perceptions and building appreciation of the material world. Our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community and to learn more about our collections, exhibitions, other upcoming virtual events, or to become a member, please check us out at fullercraft.org. Um, I'm very pleased to have our guest here today. And before I introduce her, I wanna quickly remind everyone that we are using the webinar format today. We're gonna to chat for about 30 minutes and then take some questions and answers if we have time. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q&A function. You can enter your questions at any time during our chat and we will get to them a little bit later. So without delay, I'd like to introduce our guest, Natalie Nevak, who is a sculptor and she explores the intersection of art and science by translating scientific data related to meteorology, ecology and oceanography into woven sculptures and musical scores and performances. Her main method of data translation is that of basket weaving. And central to her work is the desire to explore the role visual and musical aesthetics play in the translation and understanding of complex scientific systems such as weather. Uh, Natalie is a recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including a Paula Krasner Award, the Virginia A. Group Foundation Award, TED Global Fellowship, and two Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowships. She received an, M an MFA in sculpture and an MS in art education from Massachusetts College of Art. Her work has been shown in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia, and been reviewed by publications spanning the fine arts, design, and technology. She lives in Boston. She's here with us today with Fuller Craft Craft Chats, and she's a great friend of the museum. She's also been shown at Fuller Craft on several occasions. So I'm very pleased to introduce you all to Natalie. And welcome, Natalie. Welcome, hello. Thanks for being here. I'm gonna bring up a couple more images of your work to show people um, before we dive in. I'm so excited to have you here today um, to show us your awesome work. All right. Great. So we're just going to take a quick peek at some of this work. Um, we're looking at some pieces that we're not going to talk about today. That's correct. Yes, these are all earlier pieces. So I'm glad you brought them in because I'm not going to be actually one of them I'm going to be talking about. But yes. okay, great. And this one as well. Yes, this is a piece about Hurricane Maria, which is a recent piece that I did for a contemporary sculpture festival in Montreal about three years ago. Awesome. I think I have one more slide um, before I toss it to you. Um, thanks again for joining us today and talking a little bit about um, intersection of um, so many things, not just um, art and science, but craft as well. Very much so, yes. Um, so, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me in my studio. I'm in my studio right now. All that stuff back there is not some sort of funky background. My computer is too old to have that kind of digital background. Uh, it is my space. Uh, I, it's a studio in the in South Boston, in um, the South End of Boston in the SOA district. And I've been here in the studio since 2005, I think 2006, somewhere around there. 
Uh, I have created today a talk that will hopefully be no longer than uh, 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, because I really want to leave time for questions, uh, your questions, and please put them in the Q&A. We'll not be able to access the chat while I'm giving the talk. I put the talk together in a way that gives you an insight into the process. So I'm not showing you every single piece I've ever done, but more kind of giving you the evolution of that process of how somebody who combines art and science uh, and music kind of evolved over the years from making very didactic three-dimensional graphs to uh, performances and much more interactive um, pieces. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, you should be able to see a PowerPoint and um, unless I hear otherwise, I'm gonna assume that it's on. So all of my work, begins really the same way. It always begins with me extracting information from an environment. Sometimes I build my own collect data collecting devices like you see here on the left, or I go to the internet and I gather lots of numbers. And I use all these numbers to translate them into basket weaving uh, sculptures or musical scores. And the process really hasn't changed. I started this in around 2000 and the, the, the process of starting with data and then translating it into a sculptural piece or a musical piece hasn't really changed much. What has changed, I think, is the relationship between data and sculpture. At the beginning, the pieces were very much about explaining science to myself through some sort of tactile sculptural piece. And now in the process of many years later, data is actually helping me understand sculpture better and its potential and its, and its ability to bring in metaphors that a graph or a scientific visualization has a harder time tapping into, to tap into a nuance of the actual experience of weather that a, a weather graph has a harder time tapping into. So in some ways, this slide is really the most serious slide of the entire um, talk because it is a slide of a Lego ad from the 1980s. I grew up in the 80s and I put this one in because the reason I became a sculptor has a lot to do with the way I learn and I learn by building things and that love of building and that love of thinking through my hands really comes from toys. So I have still a lot of uh, Legos around my house. I have a lot of construction toys and I use them to think something through. So these are still very, very important to me. But the materials that I work with, the, the kind of the, the, the starting material that I, that I always start with are numbers. Sometimes they come in the form of a spreadsheet, sometimes a map, sometimes a graph. But this is sort of, this is like my raw material that I work with. My work looks very playful and when people walk into my studio or when they see my work in a gallery, they oftentimes think it's for children because there's lots of references to toys. It's lots of um, you know, primary colors and it looks very chaotic. But when you spend time looking at this after a while, you notice little tags that, that, sh that say miles per hour or Fahrenheit. So you begin to notice that underneath that visual chaos is actually a numerical logic that's holding it together. And this is all deliberate because my work is very data based. And when you tell people that your work is about sci uses scientific data, and then you also tell them, and it's, oh, by the way, it's also talking about climate change. Oftentimes the shutters come down and no one wants to engage with the work. So to prevent that kind of reaction, I try to lure the viewer into the complexity of the information I'm translating without immediately telling them that it's based on science that it's actually, and I want them to sort of enter it through the lens of a detective, through a lens of a child thinking about play and games and things like that. One of the things I love about working in the medium that I work in, both basket weaving and uh, data, is that I walk into this contradiction every day because on one hand, when you learn any kind of craft medium, and in my case, basket weaving, uh, you know, through, through, through the use of reed, which is a natural material, the first thing I, you learn is that in order to really understand a material and to really understand a process, you have to fail with that process and the material a hundred, a thousand times. So in order to really understand baskets, I have to cut them up, sit on them, melt them, splash them with water so they, so they unravel, uh, burn them, twist them, contort them to really understand what is what is the potential of that material for myself as, as, as a sculptor? But when you use that kind of language with data and you say, I'm going to twist it, burn it, sit on it, cut it up, then you very quickly find yourself in murk territory because 
is the data that I'm translating to make these forms still data or has it now become something else? And it's something that I wrestle with in the studio and I don't really have an answer to, but it's a, it's a contradiction that I love uh, when I'm working with this. What I'm interested in in weather is um, not so much in explaining weather, even though this is how it started. It was an effort to explain weather to myself and the complexity of weather, but I'm much more interested now in how humans respond to weather. And there was an article in 2014 that um, I came across and by Zadie Smith called An Elegy for a Country Season. And in it, she writes about uh, the, the need for a more diverse language to evolve that can help us understand the sort of environmental changes that are happening in our own backyard. So not just to have the science and the politics be the only language that we use to discuss climate change. And I'm gonna just quote her here. There's a scientific and ideological language for what's happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. And I'm interested in making work that invites invites a kind of more nuanced language to evolve that can investigate and explain and give voice to the to I think the oftentimes contradictory responses and human responses that we have towards uh, climate change and um, weather changes and I'm putting here an image of tropical storm Imelda tropical storm Imelda was a storm that hit Houston the Houston area a year after Hurricane Harvey, two years after Hurricane Harvey, and it caused just as much flooding as Hurricane Harvey, but people hardly know about it because it didn't never evolved into this, this big hurricane. So, but it still affected people in a very dramatic way. And so I'm, I'm interested in how, and talking to people and how flooding affects them and how flooding happens, not just in the context of hurricanes, but in all sorts of other ways that are starting to impact our lives. The word that I oftentimes think about when I'm building my pieces is a word that was coined by Professor Glenn Albrecht in 2005, who studies the psychological responses to environmental changes. And it's a, it's a word that's a combination of the word, the Latin word for comfort and the Greek word for pain. And it's, it, it defi it's defined as a form of emotional distress or homesickness sickness one feels in an environment one lives in that is undergoing change, so it no longer feels familiar. Different from nostalgia, which is a yearning for the past, the person who feels solastalgia is still living in the place in which the sense of alienation is being felt. And I'm very interested in being able to give people a voice or being able to give people a space in which they can talk about what's going on in their own environment, even if we don't always necessarily understand what's going on or if we don't necessarily always understand our re responses or reactions as being um, all that um, realistic or um, rational. So the journey though started um, in many ways through space. Uh, so I'm not got now going back in time and I'm gonna try to reconstruct sort of how this journey began from uh, working from very scientific oriented pieces to pieces that are really more about engaging people in a conversation about climate change and, and weather changes. And uh, it all really starts with the Hubble Space Telescope. So I came to this country because of this instrument and you probably can hear from my voice, I have a, a bit of an accent. So I came here when I was 12 and my father was an engineer on the Hubble Space Telescope. And so I had space stuff all over the house when I was growing up. We had a, a model of the space telescope on like a two foot model on, on top of the piano. And there was just images of space everywhere. And so when it came to take your daughter to work day, my dad would take me to work. And I saw the Hubble being built. And my dad was one of those people in those white suits down at the bottom actually physically putting this thing together. And there was a moment in my high school years that really stuck with me when my father came to the kitchen and brought this image in. This is the Hubble Deep Field uh, image. And it's when they turned the Hubble Space Telescope to a section of the constellation of Ursa Major and just uh, opened up the telescope and let it expose three or four days worth of, of of data and what they got was an image that showed lots and lots of dots that are not stars but galaxies so it's in a sense the furthest we've ever looked in into space both in time and in physical space 
in the visual spectrum. And my father kept pointing to this image and he said, this is beauty. And that's all he could really say. He kept saying, this is beauty. And I didn't understand him. And I was like, this is a strange moment. And it was also sort of unlike my father. And But it led me to go and study astronomy about 20 years later. Um, and I was living in Boston and I was trying to find a place to study astronomy. And it, it I ended up going to Harvard University Night School. And at the same time, I was taking a basket weaving class with Lois Russell, a, a very uh, well-known contemporary basket weaver. So I had this sort of strange situation where we'd be going into the lecture hall in the astronomy department, and listening to all these incredible lectures of space and time and, and stars and, and black holes and having all these, you know, the basket stuff next to me, the bucket, the, the sprayer and everything. And I was very frustrated with astronomy because everything about astronomy is so flat. You know, you can't touch a star. You can't go jump into a spaceship and fly around the, 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 the solar system. So as a tactile learner, this was a real issue. And so I started to just pay attention to how is actually, how is physical space explained in, in astronomy? I spent a lot of time looking at diagrams, trying to get, get me, give me that sense of space. And I ended up, finally deciding that for my final paper, I wasn't going to write a paper, but I was going to try to attempt to make a sculpture that can help me understand something in astronomy through some sort of tactile medium. So I ended up choosing the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is a beautiful diagram that takes two values of a star, the surface temperature and the luminosity. And based on these two stars, you can, uh, two values, excuse me, you can, uh, figure out whether the star is middle age, whether it's a newborn or whether it's, it's a dying star. And all I did here was take this graph and made it into a three-dimensional model and ended up weaving it into a basket. So this basket is pretty large. It's about three feet in diameter. And I gave it to the professor as my final paper and he didn't blink an eye. He took it and he said, thank you very much. And uh, I had a little piece of paper that explained, you know, why I was making the sculpture and what it was describing. Uh, but it was his openness to the sort of unconventional way of learning that I have been ever since so grateful for because it really kind of led me onto this journey. So I went back and thought, well, how else can I use the basket other than making this 3D version of a graph? And I started to think more and more about numbers. So I started to look at calendar. So this is a calendar of the sun when it rises and sets in Nome, Alaska, just times uh, for each day. And so I thought, well, if the basket is a, is a grid, and I think of the grid as having vertical elements and horizontal elements, what if I wanted to tr translate that information that you see on the right? And I assign each pair of vertical elements an hour of each day. So if I have 48 spokes that are the vertical spokes, and I go around, I have a 24 hour clock basically. And then I simply weave when the moon is up. So if the moon rises at seven in the morning, I'll start weaving. And then when it, if it sets somewhere around five, I'll stop weaving then. And I do the same thing with the sun and I use slightly different read. I use flat read for, for moon and round read for the sun. And what I found that over time, you, you see these kind of strange warps coming about. And that's because the reed, which is a natural material that if I exert too much pressure and read, it'll break. If you do this kind of translation over time, you get these strange undulations. And those are the undul these undulations are done by the numbers, not by myself. And that's because you have different data sets that are contorting the grid of the basket in a different way. So this is a piece I started on looking at the first day of sunlight in Antarctica which is sometime in June, to the first day of 24 hour sunlight in October. And so when you do this over time, I have this time frame now, I have a calendar from June 1st to October 28th. But I also have, in a sense, an opportunity to put more data on top because it is essentially a 3D calendar. So I, then I can go back in and I can put in high and low tide readings and um, moon phases and so forth. So this is a piece that I actually showed at the Fuller Craft Museum several years ago, it's, a, it's, a, it's a using tidal information from Boston Harbor. So the, the basket that you see in the middle here, and it's a pretty big piece, it's about five foot in diameter. The basket itself is made out of sunrise and moonrise data from January to December. So again, these 
very um, subtle undulations are because the, the moon and the sun are contorting the grid in a different way. But I can also put high and low tide readings, which are these blue sticks sticking out, um, the solar noon, moon phases of each month, and then um, the solar azimuth for each month, which is the position of the highest point of the sun in the horizon, in the sky in reference to the horizon. So what I found really interesting about this piece was that people didn't know how to respond to it because you put it in a science museum, people will read it as a title chart. You put it in an art museum, it becomes this aesthetic object. You put it in a craft museum, it starts this whole conversation about basketry and utilitarian, uh, the utilitarian applications of basketry. And so there's this, it really forces the viewer to think about, well, what kind of visual material or what kind of visual articulations do we expect to find when you walk into these different spaces? And why do we tend to trust a chart with numbers more than we tend to trust a sculpture that is made that translates these very same numbers? So there's a tension here that I was really interested in. Um, after getting my MFA at MassArt, I had the great fortune to live on the Cape for two years. I had a residency at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. And of course, if anybody who has been to Provincetown, it's an incredible place. And I wanted to see what happens if I go out to the beach every day and collect my own data, because prior to that, I'd always been using other people's data. And so I went to Herring Cove Beach and uh, went to the local hardware store in Provincetown and bought anything that could measure something. So a thermometer, a wind, a, a wind reader, a compass, a rain gauge. And I would just go to this beach every day uh, for 18 months and record things, both through the instruments that I had, but also through just observing what was going on. Eric, I see that you raised your hand. I can't really see, uh, I can't respond to any chats right now. So just save your question for later. Thanks for, for chiming in. Um, so one thing that was interesting about these 18 months is that I learned a lot about data, how difficult it is to get good data, how disciplined you have to be to get data, to collect data. And I also learned the importance of slowness, that weather is this amalgam of system that interacts with an environment. And if you really want to understand weather, you have to understand the environment through which you're looking at it. And that interaction reveals itself slowly. So there was this really nice correlation between the slowness of basket weaving and the slowness of weather observing. And what I would do is I'd go to the beach every day, rain or shine, you know, hot or cold, and then go to compare my findings to the local weather stations, to satellite images, to historical data, and just compile all these clipboards. And these clipboards all became sculptures. So here's a piece I did on looking at warm winter uh, temperatures, uh, or what then was warm winter, December and January, 2007 and eight. Again, same kind of principle of the 24 hour cycle clock so it's i'm translating the body as data from the weather station in provincetown these sort of arms that are sticking out are my own data from the beach and then the historical data and again just lots and lots of other data sets that are included temperature tides moon phases and so forth another piece that looks at a kind of lo longer range of temperature variations um, but the same kind of principle and then some pieces that looked at why right whales hang out in the ocean uh, in the Bay of Fundy in August. So looking at weather or trying to understand weather in New England, you also really have to understand the, the, the ocean and how they are responding to each other. So I spent a lot of time also looking at ocean data and ocean buoys and using their data. So all of this work though, until then was really about explaining science and the pieces became a little bit too predictable in their form. And I started to get much more interested in not just how a weather instrument records weather, because they're essentially metronomes, but how humans respond to weather. And I started to look specifically at hurricanes. And because hurricanes are these incredible disasters that you know come through a, a, a city or a neighborhood or a state, create an incredible amount of damage, and then they leave. But the aftermath of a hurricane lingers a lot longer. Years and years later, people are still working. People are still dealing with the damage of Hurricane Sandy. So I was interested in 
these very complicated responses that different cities have when a disaster strikes them like that, because every city, every community uh, responds differently and hurricanes have this tendency to really sort of reveal the weaknesses within the social, political, economic fabric of any city or uh, state. So the, I started to think a little bit more about trying to bring in a nuance, not just giving, not just taking numbers and making forms of it, but really trying to understand it through this nuance, this complex behavior re response that humans have. So the first pieces I did were pieces on Hurricane Sandy based on the roller coasters that were washed up on shore in New Jersey and Coney Island. So this is the last ride. So the, the last ride here is essentially a 3D graph that shows the weather of the night that Hurricane Sandy hit. But then you also have this kind of dragon uh, riding above. That's a reference to the sea serpent, the New England sea serpent and the legends surrounding it. So, and it is taking the last ride because the seaside, that roller coaster is no longer there. It was rebuilt, but um, in its original form, it's no longer there. Here's another piece. Uh, this is taking data from Coney Island and Seaside Heights, translating it into this floating uh, amusement park. You can read the weather off of these rides, but it's also make, giving you a reference to a future scenario. You know, maybe in the future, we will have these rides floating on rafts out in the ocean because uh, because it's going to continue uh, creating havoc in on the the uh, coastline. And so part of what I was trying to do too is to um, really kind of put a lens into how complex these responses are towards um, hurricane damages. Uh, these amusement parks, for example, are deeply connected to the economic uh, fabric of these coastal towns and not just the economic fabric, but the identity. And so a lot of times these amusement parks just simply get rebuilt. And as an outsider, you could say, well, you know, why can't you just, why can't you just move it inland for two, two miles? I mean, you're gonna have another Hurricane Sandy. But I think that really, um, misses the point that the redefining our relationship with the coastline is a lot more complicated when it is your own backyard and it's your own identity and it's your own you know mom and pop shop that depends on the summer summer business of these amusement parks so it's messy and i find that very interesting um i also started making larger pieces uh combining different um hurricanes together because we don't we don't generally understand hurricanes as these distinct chapters. Usually we have a hurricane season where there's lots of different hurricanes. So we sort of consume them all in, in, in one bit like Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, they all were in one segment, one season. Um, and then there are storms like Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy that really kind of define our conversation about hurricanes. So trying to kind of put these stories together a little bit more um, and not just sort of see them as separate chapters, but uh, disasters that influence other responses to future disasters. So this is Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. Um, it's essentially a map of New Orleans. Um, so you have this sort of dragon that's going through here that's dissecting the diagonal. That's the Mississippi River and everything above here is New Orleans, the city of New Orleans, and a map of New Orleans. There's a big wheel that translates weather data from Katrina. Then you have the levees that broke, which are these kind of towers of houses that are tumbling. These are neighborhoods that have been cut out, uh, that have been shifted through the waters. Then you have the coastline um, of the, the Gulf of Mexico. And then below are these amusement parks that translate data from Hurricane Sandy. Um, Another piece I did, and I'm going to kind of go through this fairly quickly now, uh, is another one I did on four different hurricane, uh, four different, excuse me, flooding events that impacted Louisiana since Hurricane Katrina. It's called Build Me a Platform High in the Tree So I May See the Waters. And it's taking four different flooding events that have impacted Louisiana a hurricane, a rain event that took over a week where it just basically rained in Baton Rouge for an entire week and no one, and it seemed like no one outside of Louisiana was paying any attention of it because it never really developed into a hurricane. So the news media never descended on Baton Rouge to, to report on it. 
sea level rise along the coast, the slow rising of sea level, and also the Mississippi River flooding. So four different events that caused flooding in that state, and these are just some details of that. And this particular piece started with actually a sound map where a lot of times when I work, I don't just start with the data and then go straight into um, the sculpture. It's really a back and forth between them. I'll start with some data, start making some sculptural pieces, go back to the data. But then also I sometimes try to bring in sound or try to bring in music. And so with this particular piece, I made a sound map of what these four different flooding events might look like. And so these are the four events and I'm just giving them a shape and a color and a movement. So I was thinking about how does movement, how does water move in these different um, flooding events? You know, the movement of water in a hurricane is different than the movement of water through um, sea level rise. And then I also tr would think about, well, what is the volume? What's the, what does the water sound like? And so these were sort of the, the things that kind of came up. And then I worked with a composer to translate that particular piece into um, a musical composition. So I just wanna play you uh, just like two minutes of that. This is Ethel performing it at Denison University. Ethel is a New York based ensemble and Harrison Ponce took the sound map and made a piece out of it and, and made his own composition out of it. And one thing I think to know about Harrison is that he grew up in Miami. He grew up with flood dealing, having to deal with flooding uh, on a pretty regular basis. So he sort of imposed his own experience of the flooding into this interpretation. So let's listen to this. Oops, I can just, there we go. Just for like a minute and a half. Sorry, Harrison, I have to cut it off. Um, but it gives you a sense of um, the, the, the movement of, of uh, the, the flooding. And also you can see this is a concert that's taking place in a gallery where I'm showing my work. So this is a good example of something that I started in 2009, which is called the, the Weather Score Project, where I translate information into a musical score and then work with composers all across the country in creating a concert. So we've had over 14 concerts uh, all, all, all over the states. And it's a wonderful way of bringing both music and the art community and the science community together in one place and talk about data. So the foundation of this weather score project are these musical scores that I've written that are all based on weather data. And then working with musicians to translate those scores into music. And I then use the scores to translate them into three-dimensional sculptures that not only translate the weather, but also become functional musical scores. So you'll see that the, the structure of the both the graph, both the score itself and the sculpture changes because now it has to be playable by for, for musicians. So Working with musicians, the scores change over time. And as they're very honest to tell me what works and what doesn't work, um, but it's been a really wonderful interaction. I wanna finish very briefly to talk about um, what I've been doing since the pandemic hit us because it hit me pretty hard. And I'm sure many of you out there as well. 
And uh, in March 22, I basically spent four weeks just looking at my inbox with cancellation after cancellation. And I was very fearful to lose the studio. And to me, that was sort of the absolute worst thing that could happen. And um, so I went into survival mode pretty quickly in March and took the lessons I learned from the Great Recession of 2007 and how to keep a sustainable studio going. And in 2007, I learned two lessons. One, which is make sure that you remain visible and active within the art community. I, and in however way, in you know, whatever means you can. And right now that means a lot of us are spending our time on social media. So keep those muscles going, keep making work. Even if there are no shows, keep making work. And, um, and then the other one, the lesson I learned is that you, you need other people to, to help you get through it. No one gets through a recession or a depression alone. You help each other. So make yourself available to other artists and vice versa. So I did two things. I went completely 2D in my studio work. I made these weavings that translate weather data um, from different areas, different locations uh, in through these paper weavings that are based on the hexagon grid. So for every month, this was April. So every color in here is translating some sort of weather value. So whether it's temperature or cloud cover and every weaving has two sides to it. They're very complex because there's lots of data in them. And then in June, I started to incorporate COVID data as well. So these also now translate not just weather data but also COVID data and combining data sets from different locations that I have loved ones that I haven't been able to see. And then the other thing I started was I started a business. I joined a creative business incubator at MassArt and I started a design business called Spiders and Birds named after the great weavers. And um, I make very playful uh, lamps that can be converted from table to uh, pendant lamps. And they're just really meant to kind of invoke the sense of play. It's been a really humbling step to do that because I'm in a classroom with 30 other 20 year olds and I'm the oldest person in there but it's so refreshing to learn and to to imagine myself as an artist working in a completely different realm so I want to stop now because I want to make sure there's time for questions and you might have some and but I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of kind of how I've responded to what's been happening to all of us, but also give you a bit of a trajectory of how it started with science and then really morphed into, I think, much more artistic interpretations. Yeah, I, I'm gonna just kind of jump in. There's a couple of questions in the queue and then people can continue to um, put them in while we um, start chatting. Um, I'm like, bas the basket weaving seems inherently mathematical to me. So I can kind of start to see the connection, but which came first, the love of science or the love of, of basket weaving? Both at the same time, because okay. <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, it was just serendipity, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to study the science and then baskets were, because they are such a simple grid, such a perfect way of translating the data. And mm -hmm. so it was, I saw something very, um, utilitarian, I guess, in basketry, not necessarily in creating any kind of vessel, but in giving me a grid, a simple grid that I could use. So they came at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so um, do you do any other forms of weaving? Do you do any textile weaving or is it, or is it mostly baskets? It's, it's mostly 3D because I'm a 3D kind of person. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, so you strictly, you work strictly on, um, you, you don't really dive into textiles at all. No, I tried loom weaving and I was just the most horrible loom weaver. That <laughs> I couldn't get the tension right. So yeah, I, I was all, um, I was not good at that. Yeah. It's really, I mean, the work is really fascinating and like so complex, um, just like visually they're so complex, but then like when you dive into the symbolism and the meaning, I mean, it's really wild. Um, do the colors, I think you, I mean, I do think you touched on this a bit, do the colors in your your pieces, they, they represent the, the different elements and things? Yeah, so a lot of times a blue will represent wind, uh, red temperature, green barometric pressure, and then, you know, whatever other colors I have, every piece includes a legend in it. So if you, you know, looked at, um, 
this piece here, for example, which is a piece about the perfect storm. And even though it looks really crazy and colorful, there is a legend in there that explains to you what does the blue mean? What's the blue flag versus the black flag? You know, what is the, the blue bead, the red bead and so forth. So th there's a, an explanation of, of what these colors mean within each piece. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question about your organizational system. So how do you keep your data organized as you weave the baskets? Um, the question, um, the asker uh, mentions that with like crochet, you have to count and keep track and there's lots of different data going on um, in your sculptures. So how, what's, what kind of systems have you developed um, to, to keep everything organized? Yeah, um, I have these massive folders on my computer where I um, put all the data that I'm collecting. And I have to say, I don't just collect numerical data when I'm looking at a storm, particularly when I'm trying to understand, kind of trying to get a more of a sense of the nuances of human responses to a, to a, a weather event. I also read a lot of articles. I'll read books. I'll, I'll just kind of pay attention to local media as well as national media. So <clears throat> I've, I become a hoarder of sorts. And then from <laughs> all of that, I then I start to kind of pick out what I actually want to talk about. And then I kind of choose the different points, but it's just one big folder and it's a mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not very organized. And there's a method to the madness, I'm sure. Um, so speaking of hoarding, do you work with any recycled materials? Um, not too much. I mean, I recycle materials in the sense that pieces that have been in previous sculptures are recycled and make it into a, a, a current sculpture. So that happens. And then everything that I build um, and that I don't use for a sculpture because it didn't fit or whatever comes into a pile that I call the reject pile mm -hmm. of possibilities because those parts, and there's lots of them, they become part of sculptures later on. But I don't use recycled materials in the sense of, um, you know, I, I don't use recycled plastics or, or, or any, any, anything like that. It's mostly paper, wood, reed. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So do you source um, pretty traditional like basket weaving materials? Um, do you um, color things yourself? How does, how does that work? Yeah, so I, I uh, order both, you know, basket weaving material online, and then mm -hmm. I also uh, do pretty regular trips to Home Depot and to Dick Blake, and um, I color all my own material with acrylic. I don't dye my weed anymore because I've had issues with the dye bleeding or like fading over time, and sometimes people who buy the the pieces don't realize that you can't stick them in the middle of the sun for like three years and expect to keep that vibrant color. So I started, I've, I've stayed away from dyes. I'm using mostly acrylic paint. Um, one thing that's important is that whatever I use can't cost too much money because I need to be able to mess up with it and fail with it because I'd say about 90% of what I make ends up in the dumpster at back. So I need to be able to, you know, build something and just throw it away and not not hate myself for it. That's interesting. I mean, I like that message that you give yourself the permission to fail. And you kind of mentioned that a little bit early in the beginning when you talked about um, yeah. like Legos and, and things like that is, so it sounds like failure is a large part of your process. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, you, you think that after all these years, you would, I, it would get less, but it's not like, <laughs> <laughs> it gets any easier. It's it's just the failing rate is still the same. I still have to mess up the same amount in order to get to the piece that I actually want to get to. And mm -hmm. I think that's also the hardest thing to teach uh, students is that mm. it's really your first idea or your fifth idea or your 20th idea that is that ends up being the final piece. It's usually, you know, the hundredth one down the line when you've already, you know, gone through three different sculptures and all of them are in the dumpster out back so it's yeah failing I don't I don't like the you the word failing I, th I think of it as playing I'm okay. playing and it takes me a while to get to the end of my play my play piece so I prefer to look at it that way I like that um speaking of um teaching um and working with students um we have a question about 
Um, you mentioned earlier the astronomy professor and the the piece that you made. Do you have you been in touch with that same professor? Like, well, what kind of resulted in that relationship? Yeah. So Dr. Chason is his name. Um, I've, I've I've been in, I've kept in touch with him, and actually Dr. Chason was really uh, great because after I handed in the sculpture, he invited me to present my work to science teachers. So the my very <laughs> first audience for my work was not the art world, it was the science teachers and they really liked it because it was tactile. And then another professor, Dr. Palmer, another Harvard professor also really, I, I, I've kept in touch with him and he was also very receptive to uh, this sort of different way of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of frightening the power that we have as teachers, but when you have a student who just really is curious about something and it just has this really different way of learning, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 so easy to sometimes dismiss that and say, oh, you know, you're not you're not learning it right, you're not you're not understanding it. But um, they just really gave me permission to just study yeah. it in my own way. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really incredible. It's like a really great lesson learned. Um, did you get a good grade? <laughs> well, it was hard. No, no. I mean, yeah, I kind of sort of. <laughs> I mean, it, the thing is, there's a lot of math in it as well. And one of the things that Dr. Palmer always, he would never just, um, you know, you, you, you could never just use the formula and, and uh, give him the number. You would have to explain what was going on with light in that particular instant, why that formula was being used. And so it became a spatial problem. Mm -hmm. And it was hard. Yeah, those classes were not easy. <laughs> um, we've got a question about um how you decide on the three layers um in your work the, hex the hexagonal triaxial um xyz how do you use those patterns and, and layers so uh so I, I assume this is referring to the weaving so the weavings yeah. always begin with a base layer which is a hexagon base mm -hmm. so either it's a square that's sort of a hexagon with some horizontal and verticals, or it's literally a hexagon base. And that becomes the base layer. And then once I have that on top of that, I then weave the data. So that's when the color gets differentiated between temperature, you know, temperature scale or cloud cover. Um, and, you know, why are some pieces square and why are some pieces hexagons? When I'm looking at the, I have family members uh, in Florida and in, in Europe and myself here in Boston. And so the hexagon sort of came about because I had, I was looking at data from three different locations. So the hexagon is sort of, you know, a, a, a weaving that um, comes about with three directions. And so that's sort of why these pieces came about. So it's a numbers game. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Very cool. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, but given your interest in astronomy and space, are you excited about the Mars landing? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Very much so. Do you think it'll yeah. influence any new work? Uh, you know, right now, my mind is actually more focused on COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm working, I'm, I'm going to be working with Boston University next semester in their public health department and working with students on working with COVID data. So that actually will be my next challenge. So as much as I love to go out and explore Mars, um, the paycheck's gonna come from public health first. <laughs> wow, and that's... also, you know, it's, and the, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's been really hard to work with COVID data because it's so emotionally mm. draining. And that's another kind of lesson when you're working with data, it, 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 it even if you try to look at it scientifically, if it affects you personally, it's hard to, to kind of turn that emotional lens off. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. I'm really, um, I'm really jazzed by all this intersecting of art and science. Um, it's really, it's, it's a great illustration for STEAM uh, education, how that's like, you know, just really uh something to think more about and and your um your mention about different learning styles and things like that it's really interesting um to kind of see it visually um come to come to shape in your work so thank you so much for sharing your work with us today it's been a pleasure to chat with you 
um, and to look a little bit more in depth at your work, um, I'm just going to um, say a few words of thanks to everyone who's joined us today. I'm going to share my screen for a minute um, so that uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about what we do at Fuller Craft Museum or you're interested in becoming a member or about more about our virtual programs, workshops, or other things that we do, please check us out at our website, fullercraft.org. Um, we do have lots of virtual programs um, that are going to be continued to offer um, from now into the near future. So thanks for everyone who's joined us today, um, and especially for Natalie uh, for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay, yeah, thank you. And I also I just had a chance to look at the chat. So there's lots of familiar faces. Uh, thanks. It's really meaningful when you give a talk like this in a webinar where you don't see people, but you recognize familiar names. So to all of you, I miss you. I miss you. I miss you. And <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a, in. The, the community thing is really you mentioned a little bit about community as well. So this is our, our another great opportunity for all of us to, to join uh, virtually in community. So thanks everyone for joining us and Natalie for being our guest. Yeah. Bye.